thanks for watching today. Our, our topic is from the training side of the house. Um, I've been a student and obviously and then an instructor and eventually I ended up uh, helping instructors understand how to teach more effectively uh, in our instructor development course that we run here uh, at AXE. Um, I've taught uh, CIA personnel, NSA, uh, Army, ODAs, uh, some guys from Naval Special Warfare. Uh, I've had the opportunity to, to, to train DOE uh, nest teams in surveillance detection and some things related. Uh, even trained some Navy Red Cell guys uh, and girls. And I was fortunate enough to be asked uh, to help redesign the U.S. Air Marshal um, training program when that was revamped. Uh, one thing that I've always done and something that we continue to do here at AXE, American Kinetics, uh, regardless of where anyone is on the learning curve, is to ask three questions of anything that we teach, whether it's a tactic, a technique, or a procedure. And those three questions, um, they stick with us, and we hope that they stick with our, our uh, students when they leave. The first question is, will it work? Is what you're being taught going to accomplish the task it's supposed to. The second question is, is it necessary? In other words, is it necessary to do it that way or is there a better way to do it? And then third question is, can you do that thing under stress? Will it work? Is it necessary? And can you do it under stress? This matrix helps you determine whether to keep or ditch the tactic or the technique that you're being taught. And I don't care whether you're mowing your yard whether you are doing a jigsaw puzzle or whether you are clearing a house. You add those three questions in to however you're doing it and it will help you trim the fat out of your program and make it better. You gotta get three yeses or it goes away. You gotta answer those questions with a yes on every one of them or else that tactic, that technique, whatever is, goes away and you gotta find a better way to do it. So to show you how we can apply this to your personal training plan, we're gonna examine some popular shooting ideas and contrast them against those three questions. And maybe this will help you think critically about the things that you're training to do or want to do in a future course with us or somebody else, or whether it's something you're being told to do. We're going to run it through there and maybe it'll help you in your quest to get better. In other words, we're going to poke some holes today in some common shooting myths that are still being taught today. And we're going to start off with the good old Mozambique drill. That two shots to the body and one to the head thing. What else you got for me? Huh? It's a failure drill. What's failure drill? A failure drill is something uh, that is designed to make up for a failed tactic or a failed technique. Uh, why do we do this one in particular? Because our shots to the body didn't work. If you'll remember from the last video that we put out last week, I was telling you a story about popping a guy twice with a 5.56 and he didn't go down. That was a perfect opportunity to use this drill. I did not. I put a couple more into the body. But that's what it's about. What's the situation? Well, maybe the bad guy wore body armor. Maybe the rounds didn't have the desired effect on the body, as in my case. Maybe the guy's got on clothing that's real thick. Each situation's different. What's the situation? We've got no way to know and predict that. Second question, what's the distance? Again, that's impossible to answer. But in reality, it's got to be relatively close range because that head target is going to be smaller and harder to hit the further away it gets from you, the shooter. So, let's take the Mozambique drill, let's take that failure drill, the two shots to the body and one to the head, and let's put it to the test. First question is, will it work? Yes. People kill people using this technique. Been done for decades. Okay, well that's got a yes, so what's next? Is it necessary? In other words, 
can we do it that way or is there a better way to do it? We're going to come back to this one. Let's go to the third one, which is can you do it under stress? And yes, again, for decades it's been used to kill people reliably in war, stressful situations, whatever. So yeah, we know to work under stress. Why do we do this? What's the situation? Is it because your shots to the body hit armor? What's the distance? Is it between 7 meters or 57 meters? Does it conform to reality? So let's roll back to question number two. Is it necessary to do it that way? Let's put it another way. Is there a better way to do it? Is there a more efficient way of accomplishing the same thing? What's the thing we're trying to accomplish? To drop the guy. To stop him from doing what we started shooting him for in the first place, like we discussed last week. So why not just shoot to the head first? Why not just put those three rounds, you're going to fire two to the body, one to the head, why not put those three rounds into the target's mouth and nose area right off the bat? That's the best time for, for a shot like that to that spot anyway because you know after you've shot somebody in the chest, there's a high likelihood they're going to be motivated, moving with a purpose, and definitely aware of you making that head shot a lot harder. I mean, they're going to be like moving around now, so hitting this little thing is going to be a lot more difficult. So if you've got the time and are close enough to do it while he's aware and moving, do it before that and end it right there. So the failure drill is unnecessary. Now let's look at double taps. They're also called hammers. To do this, you shoot based on a rhythm. You fire the first round and then the second round as fast as you can pull the trigger. There's a problem with this. The problem is that you cannot shoot moving targets using this technique because the target ain't going to be there for that follow-up shot. We've tested this with reactive falling targets as well as laterally moving targets. You shoot the target on a, a faller, you shoot it, it starts to fall, you shoot again, and it's gone. Furthermore, the double taps don't allow the use of the sights for the second shot. So it ain't going to be there at the second round and you're not using your sights which is not a good thing because you're responsible legally for every round that leaves your muzzle and morally so instead you shoot a controlled pair you still get off your two shots you just see the sights each time so will it work yes is it necessary to do it that way no there's a better way to do it can you do it under stress yeah people have been doing it under stress for years How about tactical reloads? A tack reload is used to refresh your gun with a new magazine. You don't have to necessarily be empty to do this because this is a want to technique. It is a want to reload. I do it when I want to. In other words, my gun has not run dry, but I have found an opportunity to refill my gun even though I may not be completely empty. So you ask yourself, what do you do with your magazine that you remove, right? What do you do with that magazine? Some people say, well, uh, I put it in my pocket or I put it in my dump pouch. Well, why are you reloading in the first place? Well, because I shot the gun and depleted some of the ammunition and I'm topping things off. Okay, yes, but why did you shoot your gun? Because there was a threat out there, right? I mean, if we're talking real world, there was a threat out there, a bad guy. So. I shot the gun and depleted, depleted some ammo because there was a bad guy out there. Then why not put the magazine back in the mag pouch where you normally get a magazine? Because you might need those rounds later. It's, I mean, it's where you always train to get them, so why don't you just train to go to, you know, you don't train to go to your pocket. So if you always train to go to the mag pouch for your magazines, if it isn't empty yet, put it back there. Because you just make things harder on purpose for yourself. Put your empty magazines in your pocket, throw them down, put them in your dump pouch, whatever. But put magazines, if they're not empty, just put them back in your mag pouch, top it off, do a press check, drive on. The other type of reload is the speed reload or the combat reload. And this is something that you do in a fight when your gun goes dry and you've got to reload your weapon. This is a have to. Uh, reload. The other was a want to. This is a have to. You have no choice. You have to reload it. Let me throw this out first though. If you find yourself out in the open, in the middle of a gunfight, and you go to slide lock empty, you have likely made some really bad life choices 
already, and th you're, you're in a bad way. But let's assume that you have to do it. Question. Do you train to perform this technique by keeping the weapon up? Let me show you what I'm talking about here. Clear and safe gun. Like some, some people, when they do it, they'll, they'll practice it this way. They'll, they'll drive the weapon out, and they'll reload, and they'll leave the gun out there like that, and then reload that way. This was a technique that was taught for many years, even at the Academy. Why did they do that? Well, most people will say, in order to keep the weapon trained in the direction of the threat. The real reason people trained to do it that way, to do it in this manner, keeping that weapon pointed down range while they're doing the reload out here, is because during a mass weapons training course where you got people lined up all on all sides of you, 50 people on the line at once, the instructors didn't want people turning their weapons left and right and endangering the lives of students and instructors, so they made everybody point them down range to perform the reload technique. And what wound up happening is at the FBI Academy and other big places, law enforcement, federal law enforcement agencies, sheriff, town sheriffs and deputies and state people would come in and they would observe this and they're like, oh, that must be the way to do it. And then they'd take it home and it spread like cancer throughout the training community. Um, they thought, well, this must be the extra ninja tactical way to do it, and we'll keep the weapon trained on the threat, when it's in fact a byproduct of a safety precaution. It's not what you want to do. Most people don't understand that, but I'm going to throw that out there. So, what are you going to do? I mean, you know, think about it for a second. What are you going to do to the threat with an empty weapon? There's no point in pointing an empty weapon at a threat unless you plan to throw it at them. It's just as fast to bring the weapon down, turn it to look at the magazine, the magazine well, make sure nothing's broken here, you can still see the threat through here, and then do your reload, and then get the weapon back on target again, get it back in the fight. So, that is the, the combat reload, or the speed reload, and just a, a way of thinking about how to do that better. Here's another odd training scar, kneeling to clear a malfunction. Will it work? Remember our three questions. Will it work? Is this necessary? Can I do it under stress? Will it work? Yeah, you can take a knee. You can clear malfunction all day long. But why? Why do you do this? If your weapon stops functioning, the best thing to do is get mobile immediately and get off the X. The X is that spot on the ground where you're getting shot to pieces. So kneeling has its place. Rise. Kneeling to get down behind cover to fix the gun that's good. That's a valid technique in certain situations. All right? But so will it work? Does it work? Yeah, at times. Is it necessary? Not always. Not always. Let's look at the strong side only reload technique for a second and run it through. Strong side only. When would you do this? Or or why would you do this? The common answer is that when your support hand is doing something else, maybe you're injured, um, you can't use this hand to do the reload, maybe uh, you're carrying something, uh, maybe you're dragging your buddy with this, with this hand, or you're controlling your principal with this hand as you're moving, moving them around, moving out. So the question becomes this, where do you place your weapon in order to accomplish this technique, right? I've got to reload my weapon with one hand, where do I put this thing? Do I put it under my armpit? Do I put it in the, between my legs? Do I put it in the crook of my knee or the back of my knee and hold the gun and then reload with that free hand? I mean, do I do, I do you know, one of these and then reload from here? What, what's the problem with that technique? Well, one thing is you can't get mobile if you need to. I mean, if you stick it between your legs, you're pinning it with your knees, you can't run, you can't move. So, will it work? Yeah, you can hold a gun between your knees and reload it, or in your armpit, reload it, provided the mag well is exposed and you can get to it and you can see it. So, will it work? Yes. Can you do it under stress? Yes. That technique, this technique, has been done before in stressful situations. But, is there a better way to do it? Yes, there is. Why not put the gun back into the holster, All right? You fired the pistol, you eject the magazine, put it back in your holster, pull out the spare magazine, 
pop it in, get back to work. The holster is made to hold a weapon, and you can perform the reload with the strong side hand easily, and you have the option, if you need to, to brake left, right, front or, you know, front or rear. You can get off the X if you have to, if you have to move. This next topic is a touchy subject across the gun world, or at least it has been. But in reality, it shouldn't be anymore after 20 years of war. And that is stance. So, there's that. In particular, we're talking about the isosceles versus the weaver stance. The weaver stance requires the shooter is turned to the target to minimize the shooter as a target. He's firing with a pushing arm and an opposing arm that is pulling slightly, pulling slightly. And supposedly this forms a stable shooting platform from which to fire the weapon. Will it work? Yes. Will it work? Is it necessary? Can I do it under stress? Will it work? Yes. People have been killing people using the Weaver technique for decades. I mean, a long time. In fact, uh, it was the first stance I was taught at, by the U.S. government when I EOD'd decades ago. EOD is short for Interim Duty, not Explosive Ordnance Disposal. Can you do it under stress? Of course you can. But is there a better way to do it? In other words, is it necessary to do it that way? Will it work? Is it necessary? Can I do it under stress? First, let's ask some logical questions. How do you use body armor from this position? If I turn sideways and I'm pointing the pistol at you like that, I can't maximize my armor because I'm not turned to the target, right? The threat's the target. I'm not turned to the target like that. How do you? Sh Here's another question. How do you shoot one-handed from this position? Because according to the definition, you can't because you will theoretically push your gun out into the street because there's no opposing hand pulling back against it. So you must not be able to fire one-handed if you shoot Weaver. So Weaver uh, fails um, to the lessons learned from people, uh, from shooting people while wearing body armor, primarily. You have to face the threat head on. Uh, plates need to face the target to maximize the protection they provide. If I turn sideways or if I blade to the target, I give up my armpits. I give up, that's a straight channel into my heart lung area, which will kill me. So I want to present the plate face on, not leaning over, but face on, perpendicular to the threat. The next one is the 21 or 30 foot rule. The 21 foot rule says that a bad guy with an edge or a blunt weapon at 21 to 30 feet or less can still get to you and kill you even though you shot him. Unless you get a CNS hit and you turn off his light. CNS central nervous system, pons, medulla, oblong out of that area right around where the earlobes come in or the base of the skull. It's based on physics that a body in motion is going to continue and it also is based on the fact that unless a CNS attack is successful, people will not die and cease activity immediately just because they've been shot. Um, they'll take hits, they'll keep fighting, and if they're armed with an edge weapon, they're going to cut you to ribbons even with multiple bullet holes in them. Think about a deer for a second. You shoot a deer, deer hunting, blow their heart out. They run for hundreds of yards because they haven't watched TV and know they're supposed to fall. They'll only stop if you hit them in the brain in a certain spot, or you get their structural support broken down like you hit a bone, or you punch enough holes in them so that their blood pressure drops and it renders them unconscious. That's kind of like a loss of hydraulic pressure. That's how bad guys go down. The actual technique for dealing with this threat is that you get offline as you fire at the bad guy. The technique is simple. You move and you shoot. The next one is immediate threat training. And this is cool for people to practice on the range and stuff. Guys get up close and you know they're standing within like right here to a target and they block and they do all this. But the bad guy is with the arm's reach of you and he's attacking you, all right? And the technique calls for you to block, draw your weapon, and fire all at the same time. That's three movements, three, not six, but the distance is arm's reach. Ask yourself this, why at a shorter distance, 
in the face of an immediate threat to my life do I pile on a complicated series of movements? Why not just treat it like the 21 foot rule, get offline and shoot? Here's the last one. Instinctive shooting, also called point shooting. Something instinctive, if you'll track with me here, something instinctive is innate, right? It is something that you do not need to train in order to accomplish. So if it's instinctive, why do you train at all? Why even go to the range if shooting is instinctive? Another question is, at what range can you perform instinctive shooting? The common answer is usually anywhere under 15 yards. How big is that target? How small is that target? But a response is that if it is instinctive, why is there a range limit at all? Think about it. I mean, pulling my hand from a stove, a hot stove, that is instinctive, right? Learn that as a kid. Do it once, you'll never do it again. You'll always pop that hand back moving away from a snake. That is somewhere in my DNA. That is instinctive. But in my opinion, nothing is instinctive about drawing a mechanical device from a holster, raising it to my head, lining up the front and rear sight, and the target, all while me and my target are moving in different directions, maybe over uneven ground, and then pulling the trigger, causing an explosion in here, to launch a chunk of metal that way to intersect that moving object many yards away from me all in under second and a half. That to me is decidedly not instinctive to human beings at all. So instinctive shooting, will it work? At very very close distances, yes, you could index the pistol towards a target and hit something large if it's close. Is it necessary? No. There's a better way to do it. Can you do it under stress? Not out past certain distances, no. You can't. I mean, put somebody out there at 25 yards and give them a man-sized target and ask them to hit the X box in the middle? Mm -mm. Maybe out of a full magazine, they'll get it a couple times, but that is absolute luck. The bottom line is this. When it comes to all of these things, Keep it, it's the KISS principle, keep it simple, student, right? KISS, keep it simple, student. Don't, don't overload things. Um, don't paralyze yourself by analyzing things too much, but at the same time, you do need to look at things critically. You need to think and run every technique or tactic somebody teaches you through that matrix. If you, you know, it's, if you don't get a yes to each one of those three questions, then look for a better way to do it. There's nothing wrong with looking for a better way to do something, making it better and more efficient. We believe in this so much that we've even got it on our instructor t-shirts. Um, you, can, you can find this shirt along with a host of other things like hats and hoodies and holsters and edge weapons and more of this all on our uh, website. Um, it'll be in the, the link will be in the description below. Uh, this gear is all gear that we use, we believe in, we've curated it from suppliers all around the industry. We've tested this stuff, we've used it overseas, we've trusted our lives with this stuff. Um, uh, you know, not necessarily the t-shirts but the hats, but the gear. Um, so we hope this video today helps you as you continue to train. If you liked it, I certainly would encourage you to share it. Um, share this with your friends on social media. Uh, subscribe to this channel if you are so inclined. We would greatly appreciate that. It helps us uh, create more content for you. And um, we thank you guys for watching. And God bless you and stay safe.